Today we're going to continue in our series on end time events and we're going to talk about the second coming of Jesus Christ. We're going to talk about what exactly is going to happen at the second coming, how is this second coming different from his first coming, and also how is this second coming different from the rapture. All of that is coming up today on The Beat. Hey, my friend, welcome back to The Beat. My name is Alan Parr. Thank you so much for tuning in. If this is your first time here, it's a pleasure. If you want a free ebook, click the link in the description box below. If you enjoy this video, consider subscribing. Hit that little bell notification so you won't miss a beat. Okay, so I don't want to waste your time, so we're going to jump in and we're going to ask and answer three questions about the second coming. Number one, how is the second coming different from the first coming? Number two, how is the second coming different from the rapture or are these two the same event? And then finally, what exactly is going to happen and take place at the second coming of Jesus Christ. So question number one, there are several differences between Jesus' second coming and Jesus' first coming. First of all, when Jesus came the first time, he came primarily to serve and to give his life as a payment or ransom for our sin. But when Jesus returns the second time, he's not coming to serve, he is coming to rule and to destroy sin once and for all. Second of all, at Jesus' first coming, the Jews rejected him as their savior, but at the second coming, the Jews are going to receive him as their savior. Now, the reason why the Jews rejected Jesus Christ at his first coming was that they were paying attention to certain scriptures in the Old Testament that talked about this coming Messiah. The problem is that some of the scriptures were talking about what Jesus was going to do at his second coming. He's going to be a king. He's going to rule. He's going to have power. And so when Jesus came the first First time and he was meek, he was weak, so to speak. He, he was a docile man. He was uh, being punished. He was suffering. He was being crucified. They were like, hey, how is this guy going to rescue us from Roman oppression? How is this guy going to be the Messiah that we long for? And so they rejected him. But now at his second coming, they're going to receive him as their savior. Which leads me to the third difference, which is at the first coming, Jesus is described as the lamb of God. And when you think about a lamb, a lamb is a nice, calm, docile animal. But at the second coming, Jesus is described as the lion from the tribe of Judah. He is coming to rule. He is coming to reign. He is coming to destroy. He is coming to punish sin once and for all. So these are just a few differences between his first coming and his second coming. Now, the controversy is, what is the difference between the rapture and the second coming? Some people do not believe in the rapture, but the Bible is very clear that these are two very distinct events. And I'm going to highlight a few of the differences now. First of all, at the rapture, the Bible says that Jesus is going to be coming for his saints. But at the second coming, it says that Jesus is going to be coming back with his saints. That's a big difference, right? So when the Bible talks about the rapture, it talks about Jesus returning to take us somewhere to so we can be with the Father. But at the second coming, it describes us as already being with Christ in heaven and returning to earth so that we can experience and enjoy his kingly leadership and rulership in the millennial kingdom, which we'll talk about in just a moment. Secondly, the Bible describes the rapture as an event where we will meet Jesus in the clouds. However, the second coming coming, Jesus will actually set foot on earth. The Bible actually says that he will set foot on the Mount of Olives. So that's another big difference between the rapture and the second coming of Christ. And then finally, the rapture can occur at any given time. There are no other events that need to take place in order for Jesus to return. However, the second coming of Jesus Christ must be preceded by several end time events, most of which are described in Matthew chapter 24, where Jesus Jesus talks about these things must take place before the Son of Man actually returns. So I actually have another video on the rapture and the second coming. I'm going to link that in the description box below. Put a card somewhere up on the screen if you want further explanation as to why I believe in a rapture and not just the second coming of Jesus Christ. Now, the third question we want to ask and answer is what exactly is going to take place at this second coming of Jesus Christ? Well, the first thing that we see is that there is going to be some sort sort of marriage ceremony between Jesus Christ, the groom, and the church, which, which is described as the bride of Christ. 
Now, what's so interesting about how the Bible describes our relationship as the bride of Christ with Jesus, our groom, is that it actually closely parallels or mirrors the marriages that were happening in the uh, ancient Near East in the Oriental culture. There were four stages of every single marital relationship. Stage number one was the betrothal, and that was when the groom pledged his commitment to his bride and promised that one day he would come back and take her, take full possession of her rather. But the second stage of any Jewish wedding was the presentation stage. And that was when the groom would leave for a period of time and he would go to his father's house and prepare a home in his father's house. And then one day he would come back for his bride and take full possession of her and then bring her to live with his father for the rest of their lives. And then third, there was a marriage ceremony where the two would come together. And then finally, that ceremony was then capped off with a celebration. Well, we see all four of these phases in how Jesus courted us, the church, the bride of Christ. He pledged his commitment to us on the cross when he said, I love you so much that I'm going to die on the cross for you and I'm going to pay for all of your sins. And then in John chapter 14, he says, hey, I must go because I'm going to my father's house. In my father's house, there are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. So I'm going to go and prepare a place for you so that I may bring you to where I am. And then there's going to be this marriage supper, which I'm going to go to the scripture to show you in just a moment. And then after that, there's going to be a honeymoon, if you will, a 1000 year millennial kingdom on earth where we're going to celebrate with Jesus Christ for a thousand years. There's going to be peace and joy and righteousness and contentment because all of evil will be eradicated and Satan will be locked up, which I'm going to talk about in just a moment. So let's take a closer look at this marriage ceremony in uh, Revelation chapter 19. It says this in verse 7, Let us rejoice and be glad and give him glory, for the wedding of the Lamb has come, and his bride has made herself ready. Now, it says now, Fine linen, bright and clean, was given her to wear. Fine linen stands for the righteous acts of God's holy people. Let's just stop right there. I love this picture because even though you and I are sinful people, we've made many mistakes, we've gone against God, we've done things that we should not have done, at our wedding day, all of that will be made clean. We will be forgiven and we will be clothed in white, which signifies complete and total purity. Now let's keep going. It says here in verse nine, then the angel said to me, write this, Blessed are those who are invited to the wedding supper of the Lamb. And he added, these are the true words of God. Now, I'm not sure exactly what this looks like or how this is going to take place, but the Bible seems to suggest that there's going to be some sort of ceremony where Christ is eternally united with us his bride, the church. But then the second thing that's going to take place at the second coming of Christ is that there's going to be a set of judgments. Some scholars believe there's two, some believe there's three, some believe there's as many as four. Regardless of the fact, one such judgment is going to be reserved primarily for believers. That's you and I. Yes, we are going to be judged based on how we lived our life here on earth. And the name of that judgment is actually called the Bema Seat of Christ. Now, I have a complete other video that I want to direct you to that you can watch that, but let me just kind of give you the overview. Basically, this uh, word Bema comes from the idea of the Olympic Games or the Ithmus Games, and the Bema was the name of the seat upon which the judge would sit. But the interesting thing about this is that only the victors were uh, pr primarily Primarily invited to come to this Bema seat. In other words, rewards and rewards only were given out at this Bema seat, not punishments in any way, which lets us know that when we stand before God at our judgment, we're not going to be judged for our sin, but we're going to be rewarded for the righteous things that we have done. Now, what is the criteria for this? Well, what motives do we have whenever we're doing ministry, whenever we talk, every word that we speak? Um, what actions do we take? How faithful were we with our time, our spiritual gifts and our talents and our treasures, our money and the things that God has given us to steward while we are here. All of these things 
are going to be the basis upon which God establishes the rewards, the crowns that we will receive in heaven. Now, the second judgment is one that I've actually never dealt with on this channel. I want to spend a little bit of time on that. And that is specifically for unbelievers. And this is called the great white throne judgment. And uh, the Bible describes this in detail in Revelation chapter 20, verses 11 through 15. So let's check it out. It says here, then I saw a great white throne and him who was seated on it. Now that is God the Father. The earth and the heavens fled from his presence and there was no place for them. And I saw the dead, great and small, standing before the throne and the books were opened. It continues. Another book was opened, which is the book of life. The dead were judged according to what they had done. I want you to pay attention to two little words there, according to what they had done. This lets us know that God is a fair God. God is a just God and that hell is not going to be to the same degree of punishment for every single unbeliever, right? That would not be fair if everyone suffered the same. Instead, rather, the Bible is very clear. I actually have another video on my channel uh, entitled, Are There Different Degrees of Punishments in Hell? You want to check that one out because the Bible seems to be uh, clear that uh, to some people who had more understanding and more revelation, in other words, God revealed more of himself, his will to them, but, but they rejected that will. To them, they will receive a greater punishment. But for other people who maybe they weren't blessed with the same understanding, Maybe they didn't have access to the Bible. Maybe they didn't grow up in church or whatever. If they didn't accept Jesus Christ, their fate is going to be the same in terms of going to hell, but their punishment is not going to be the same because they didn't have, to have the same experience or the same opportunity to respond to truth because the same truth was not revealed to them as it was to someone else. Verse 13, the sea gave up the dead that were in it and death and Hades gave up the dead that were in them and each person was judged, here it is, according to what they had done. So once again, unbelievers are going to be judged based on what they did because what lies within all of us is a conscience, whether you're a Christian or not. We all have a conscience and whether we obeyed that conscience or disobeyed that conscience is one of the things that God is going to use to determine their eternal punishment. Now, after the punishments are dished out, it says here in verse 14, then death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. Now, I need to stop right there. I don't have time to go into all of this, but there are different parts. There are different compartments of hell. Uh, one is what's called Hades in the New Testament, which is basically describing the general place of torments. In the Old Testament, it was called Sheol. But then uh, at some point, all those who are in Sheol or Hades right now are going to uh, be uh, removed or transferred over to their final resting place, which is the lake of fire. So I want you to think of uh, Hades as basically jail. And I want you to think of the lake of fire as prison. So jail is basically where you hang out until you your final sentence or your final punishment actually takes place. But then once that happens, you don't stay in jail anymore. You're now going to prison where you're going to live out the rest of your sentence. And so basically right now the, the, the uh, uh, lake of fire is empty, but Hades is full. But then at some point, the people in Hades are going to be transferred over to lake of fire and then Hades is going to be empty and then the lake of fire is going to be full. And then it says the lake of fire is the second death. Anyone whose name was not found in the book of life was thrown into the lake of fire. Now, the last thing that's going to happen at the second coming of Jesus Christ is that Satan is going to be bound for 1,000 years. Now, remember, the other two members of the unholy trinity, the beast, that's the Antichrist, and the false prophet, the guy that tries to mimic the Holy Spirit, they have already been cast into the lake of fire, so their fate is secure. But for whatever reason, God is going to allow Satan to uh, hang around for 1,000 more years, although he's going to be locked up, and then after 1,000 years, God's going to allow him to, uh, to, to be released for just a very short period of time and then later he's going to be cast into the lake of fire. So I hope this video gives you a much clearer picture as to what exactly is going to happen and take place at the second coming of Jesus Christ. If you found this video helpful in any way, feel free to share it with a friend. Also, if you haven't done so already, I would love it if you would subscribe. Check out some of the other videos on this channel. Thank you so much for watching. I'll see you next time on The Beach.